what's happening overseas, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, the name that is in control of Afghanistan, the name that is in control of Haiti. Father, we pray, God, that you would be with the, uh, uh, the people who call those places home. Father, they need you right now. Father, I pray, God, that you would intervene. I know that you already are. Father, we know that you're already doing things that we do not see or do not know. But, Father, we pray, God, that you would put, I ask that you would just send heaven's army down to protect the men, uh, military men and women that are there, but also protect uh, the country folks there as well, those who call those places home. Father, I pray that you would, you would stand up against uh, those who want to do evil. Father, I pray, God, that you would, you would, uh, those who want to do evil, Lord, I pray that you just stand up and, God, and they're confused. God, they don't, they can't do anything. So, Father, I pray for protection. I pray that you would watch over them. I pray, God, that you would uh, intervene like you already are. Father, I pray, God, that you would be with the folks in Haiti right now, Lord, as they are, are going through this earthquake and this hurricane. And, Father, and I know that loved ones are being missed and, uh, they're trying to find them. So, Father, I pray, God, that you would be with the search and rescue folks. Father, that they would be able to have uh, your eyes and your direction and know where they uh, need to be to find um, uh, those missing people, Lord. I pray, God, that you would just cover this, these, these countries, Lord. I pray, God, that you just be with them, Lord, and love on them, Father. And Father, I just pray, God, that you would just be, uh, just be more in the world. Father, and I pray, God, that your, your body, God, the Christians, the one who call you by name, Father, would rise up and, and, and just stand up and look evil in the face and say, not today. And so, Father, I ask, God, that you would, uh, you would just join even us here, Lord, in, in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Father, it has been on my heart, Lord, you know, we, we've been having conversations, Lord. God, uh, what more can we do? Tell me what more we can do as, as a as me as an individual or as, as living water, the church, God, show us what we can do to help those in Afghanistan and Haiti, Lord. But also, Lord, help us to be reminded of the community that we're in, Lord, and impact our community as well. We're ready. We're primed. Because your word tells us greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world, and we need to live that way. And so, Father, I just lift this time up to you, and I praise you, and I thank you. <laughs> you are a good God. You are an amazing God. And I thank you, God, for the freedom that you are about to burst on Afghanistan and Haiti. I praise you. I thank you, Lord. Because, God, we choose to live by faith and not by sight. And so, Lord, I praise you and thank you for all that you do and for all that you are. And we just love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, we, are, we have just started a series called The Kingdom-Minded Church. Last week, we talked about um, what does it mean to have a kingdom-minded church versus a churchdom-minded church. And we're going to just continue on in our series of a kingdom-minded church. It's a five-week series, and so put your seatbelt on. Let's get ready to roll uh, and just get after it. So we're going to continue on in our series. There are two seasons that I love the most. The first season that I love is summer. I love Summer. Check out the tan, y'all. Check out the tan. Right? I love summer. I love mowing the yard. I love sitting on the back porch. I love drinking a lot of sweet tea. I just love summer. You can do that in the winter too, sweet tea, by the way. I just love it. I love it. It's my favorite season. My second favorite season is football season. I love football. I think football is probably one of the best sports ever. Ever. But if you look at the, if you look at football, I, I, I played it in high school. I played it in college, intramurals. Uh, I played it there, uh, and I just, I just love it. I love the concept of it. I love the game. When I was in, when I was in high school, I played defense. I was a defensive guy. There is nothing better than sacking the quarterback. Oh my gosh, it was amazing. And to hear the air come out of that guy is awesome. And you're like, hey man, can I, you probably need to lay there a minute. 
right? It was so much fun. And I was one of those cocky guys, right? So if I tackled the cornerback, I would get up and then say, hey, I'll be back. And I'd just walk away. This is how it was. I love football. So there's an offensive side and there's a defensive side. On the offensive side, the objective for the offensive team is they are to advance the ball. They are to gain yards. Their goal is to score touchdowns, put points on the board. That is their job. That is what the offensive uh, team does. Then there's a defensive side. There's a defensive team. And their job is to stop the offense from advancing the ball, to stop them from gaining yards, to, to take the ball away from them, to prevent them from getting touchdowns or prevent them from getting points or gaining points. You see, an offense moves the ball forward. It advances the ball forward. And a defense is to prevent the offense from moving forward. The biblical church exists to advance the kingdom and not simply defend it. The biblical church exists to advance the kingdom, not simply defend it. We're going to go back to Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to look at one verse today. This is going to be verse 18. So go to Matthew 16. Look at it, verse 18. And while you're doing it, why don't you just turn to the person next to you and say, hey, Jesus looks good on you. And then say, I mean it this time. Right? Make that happen. <laughs> Jesus looks good on you. And I, and I, and I always mean it. Always mean it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Matthew 16, verse 18. If you got it, say Amen. If you need a minute, say, give me a minute. Awesome. Let's stand as we read God's word. We, it is uh, it's what we do here at Living Water to honor God's word. We stand on it. So Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. It says this. And I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I'm just going to read that again. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you that you are the one who built the church. We praise you and thank you that you are the one who set the blueprints, the, the guidelines for us to follow. And I pray, God, that here today as as men and women and, and children are gathered here, Lord, that we, we are thinking with a kingdom mind. And so, Father, I pray, God, that you would just open our, our, our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our ears. God, we want to see your word, hear your word, feel your word. Father, I pray, God, that all the words that come out of my mouth are not mine, they're yours. And I pray, God, that we would receive it. And so, Father, I thank you, God, for how powerful and mighty the church is. And let us understand that. And so, Father, I thank you, God. I'm excited to get into your word today. So, Holy Spirit, speak and move in us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a seat. Have a seat. Let's look at that verse again. Matthew 16, verse 18. Let's, let's pull it up. I have some words underlined there. Check this out. It says this. It says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock... I will build my church. Say build. build. And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. He says, Jesus says, he's speaking to Peter. He says, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. <laughs> when I was in high school, back in the 90s, the biggest thing to do was have all these kind of speakers in the back of your car. And my friend Justin and I decided that we were going to make a speaker box for his Suzuki Samurai. <laughs> Do you know what those are? Those are the cars that you go and you push your reversal and go forward, you know, kind of like those. So we're building these box, and Justin and I have no idea what we're doing. So we have the material, we have the tools, and we are making cuts, and the cuts aren't straight. We're the pieces that we're trying to, we're just trying to build a box and they're not matching up. There's gaps in between when we put it on top of it. There's a gap in there. We're like, how do you do that? Because uh, uh, a speaker box has to be completely sealed. 
There cannot be any air coming out of it whatsoever. And when, by the time that Justin and I, we spent hours trying to put this together in my garage. By the time we got done, this speaker box is kind of like this and like this. And we're like, what, what are we, we don't know what we're doing. My dad comes out into the garage. He's trying to figure out why are these teenage boys messing with my tools. He sees the project that we're doing and he chuckles. So he grabs our tools and he grabs the same material and he makes the cut straight. He actually puts them together and they mesh. There's no gap, there's no hole in there. There's, I mean like it's sealed. He closed the gaps and all the pieces match, right? All he had to do was make some adjustments on the cuts and they were perfect and all the pieces match. And we had a speaker box that looked like a speaker box and it only took my dad 30 minutes to do that. <laughs> Psalms 127.1 says this, Unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labor over it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays alert in vain. <clears throat> Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church. You see, if we tried to build the church on our own, our cuts are not going to be straight. Our pieces are not going to match. There's going to be gaps in between the pieces, and our labor will be in vain. But when Jesus builds the church, the foundation is unbreakable. The foundation is unshakable. And the cornerstone is put in place. And the message of Jesus spreads out like an out-of-control wildfire. It actually advances when God builds the church. The church is powerful. Its foundation is powerful. Speaking of foundations, let's look at Matthew Chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built, say built, built. his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation, say foundation. foundation. Its foundation was on the rock. Amen. The church is built on the rock of salvation. And it is wise that the church be built on this rock. Because nothing can destroy it because its foundation is on the rock. When I say rock, that means Jesus. The church is built on the rock. The church is built on Jesus. Jesus built the church on the rock. Jesus built the church on him. Jesus builds the church. As Jesus builds his church, hell sees him doing it. And hell doesn't like what Jesus is doing, so it tries to stop him. It actually tries to stop the church. Jesus and his church are on the offense. And hell is on the defense. Listen. Listen. Jesus didn't build his church to react to the movements of hell, but to set the pace of heaven. Amen. That was so good, I'm going to say it again. <laughs> Jesus didn't build his church to react to the movement of hell, but to set the pace of heaven. Amen. That's deep. That's why today my, offensive, or, uh, my sermon is called Offense versus Defense. When you have a kingdom-minded church, you need to be an offensive-minded church, not a defensive-minded church. But let's look at the defensive side of the church, the defensive-minded of the church. And I think that we have to understand who our enemy is. I think we have to understand who the enemy of the church is. Let's check it out. John 10.10 10 says, A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy Jesus is talking about the devil here, Satan here. He's a thief, he's a stealer, he's a killer, and he's a destroyer. Listen to how he speaks about him in John 8, 44. He's speaking to these men. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires 
He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. Let's keep this up there for a minute. Jesus calls the devil out again. He calls him a murderer. He says he does not stand for the truth. The devil doesn't stand for the truth because, in fact, there is no truth in him whatsoever. He's a liar. And that's all he knows how to speak. He is the father of lies. Listen, the devil does not have your best interest in mind. He doesn't care about you. He hates you. That's your enemy. Why do we allow him any microphone time in our minds? He doesn't care about you. He's a father of life. He doesn't speak truth to you. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? Anybody going through some stuff right now? And the devil is speaking lies to you and all of a sudden you're kind of believing it? <laughs> he doesn't care about you. So let me ask you this question. So why would the devil ignore God's church? Why would he ignore you, God's people? Why would he ignore, ignore God's children? You know, the devil will do whatever it takes to tear the church apart and make the church stumble, make the body hate on each other, be distracted by worldly things, make them think that they are the creators of church because it has their name on a plaque in the hallway. The way that you know that the church is not operating as Jesus' church is that it will be reacting to hell's advances and it will be falling or failing to stop them. It's, it's like the church is allowing Satan to steer the church in the opposite direction of how Jesus built the church. Defensive-minded church. I was invited to come see a small church in Denver Oh, years and years ago. The building was gigantic. It was huge. But the gathering there, the gathering of people, the church was small. You see, back in the day, back in the 60s and the 70s, this church was in the middle of downtown Denver and it was hopping. It was booming. And in fact, I was told that in 1970, somewhere in the 1970s, they built a children's wing because there were so many children coming to this church and they were excited about that. And we should be excited about that. One of the pastors that I was there with that was mentoring this church and helping it along, he says, uh, and this was back in the 2000s, so maybe like 2010 maybe. And uh, he was telling me, he says, Jason, the last victory that this church had was when they built that children's wing in 1970. They hung their hat on it. They were excited about it. But what happened was is that they started to miss the vision, started missing uh, the blueprints. When we went there, there were only 10 people that went to this church. Ten people that were there. And my heart was hurting. Can I tell you something? The devil is good at distracting. I went to a church here in town, small church here in town. It was struggling. So I went to go see what I could do to help. Right? Because there should not be any battle about the living water versus this church or that church. We should just gather together and let's rock this. So I went to this church that I, that they called and said, hey, we're, we're struggling. I was like, okay, let's figure this out. I went and met with the pastor. The pastor said, you know, Jason, um, well, some of my leaders and I, we went to actually go, it's in this little community. Oh my gosh, they can impact this community. They have this amazing uh, playground. They took all the equipment out, like all the swings and all, all the stuff, like all the basketball, they took the hoop off, everything. And I was like, what are they doing? I was talking to the pastor, and, and the pastor says, you know what, we had the door open one summer night and because there was no air, air conditioning uh, there. And so these kids came up on their bikes and came to the opening of the, the door, and they're looking around, and the pastor's like, hey, you guys want to come in? And they're like, no, 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 my parents said that this is a dead church. I said, how did you take that? He's just like, well, thanks for coming. I said, why are, there no, why are there no swings on the, on the, on the swing set? And why would you take the hoops down? He says, well, we didn't want to get sued in case someone got hurt. 
I said, I said, you need to put those swings back up there. You need to put that hoop back up there and put a sign. If you get hurt, your fault. <laughs> You're free. You're free. I said, I want to help you, right? Because they're in the community. And all these kids are coming in. Let's make sure that they don't see that this is a dead church. Let's see that they're alive. I want to help. So how about this? Why don't we do vacation Bible school together? Okay? I will pay for all the material. I will bring it all here to this house. I'll bring my entire team. My church will join your church. And we will do it. And we will rock this community. What do you say? You know what he said to me? No, thank you. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you think you can get any of your folks to come? He goes, I don't know. If you get one person to come to volunteer, I will do it all. He wouldn't even volunteer. Can I tell you something? The devil was telling them lies. Happened in the church I was serving in too had this amazing idea. Why don't we block off a street and let's have a block party. And let's just have, and, and we did, we blocked off the street and there was a row of tables, like tables, like, you know, a banquet table. We had all the chairs and the tables out there and we invited our community to come. Dinner on us! It's amazing. Awesome idea. At the time, I was, I was pastoring your church to 200, 250 people. Only 10 people from the church came. And I was stunned. I was like, oh no, you did it. <laughs> I was stunned by that. I mean, people from the community were coming to sit down at the table that we presented in the middle of the street, that the police said, hey, it's all good. And we got to know people, the 10 people in, the, from our church and I got to meet these people, invest in them, in love on them. It was more burgers and hot dogs for me. <laughs> I asked the folks, I asked the church, where were you? We showed up, where were you? And most of them there said, you know what, Pastor? It wasn't my thing. The devil loves it when the church is lazy. A defensive-minded church is actually internally focused. They say things like, well, we've always done it this way. I've done my part, now it's someone else's turn to take over. If you don't start doing it this way, I will stop tithing until you do. <laughs> That's been told to me. If you don't start doing things this way, Pastor, I am not going to tithe anymore until you do. You know what I said to them? You're on dangerous grounds. Because you're not going to hurt me or the church. You're just hurting you. So you do you. Because I'm pretty sure that when, when God built this church, he didn't say, well, this person needs to tithe or it fails. He doesn't say that. I don't listen to that. Pastor, if you don't do what I want, I'm going to stop tithing. Okay. That's on you. When you get to heaven, have that conversation with Jesus. <laughs> I've had some folks, actually, excuse me, sir, excuse me, ma'am. I know that you're new here, but you're sitting in my spot. I'm going to have to ask you to move, please. I've actually had that happen. I actually approached that person and I said, um, what are you doing? These are, these are visitors. Yeah, they're in my spot. I became very sarcastic. I got down on all fours and looked under the pew. I don't see your name here. I sit here all the time. Sit over there all the time. I apologize to these people. I'm really sorry that you sat in his spot. Please come forward and sit in my spot. Oh, and here's my notes. You're preaching today, too. <laughs> Those folks never came back. True story. I come from upstairs, from the basement, to where my deacons are passing out bulletins. And two of them are fist fighting. 
and fighting. You know why? Because one deacon was standing in the other deacon's spot. Both men were in their 80s. I'm in my 30s. And I grabbed both men by the shirt. I couldn't pick them up because they're kind of heavy. And I just put them in a room like a parent. Put them in the room and said, you are embarrassing. Not to me, not to this church, but to the kingdom. Because you stared in this man's position? I mean, bulletins all over the floor. At your age. Do not come out of here until you have resolved the issue. I'm speaking to my elders. They were my elders and my deacon, but they're older than me. You understand what I'm saying? Respect your elders. I was hot. And I got to go upstairs and preach a message of salvation now. And I'm ticked. Without unity of, of purpose, the gates of Hades, Satan and his minions will overpower and engulf us. Yeah. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, say build, yeah. and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Offensive-minded church. This church is advancing. There's a story in 1 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 17 through 18. I want to bring it to your attention. This is about King David. So when this was reported to David, he gathered all Israel and crossed the Jordan. He came up to the uh, Armenians and lined up against them. When David lined up to engage them, they fought against him. But the Armenians fled before Israel, and David killed 7,000 of their charioteers and 40,000 foot soldiers. He also killed Shabak, the commander of the army. This is a battle that those who were coming against Israel, they didn't want to fight because they saw how powerful David's army was. As they retreated, they ran, actually, they retreated, and David met him off, and they cut him off, and they ran into David, and they met him at the Jordan, and when they saw David and his army, they said, we might as well engage in battle, we might as well fight. And David took him up on it, and he fought him, and he beat the tar out of him. And this, this other country, they took a great loss, in fact, they lost their commander. You see, David is known as a man after God's own heart. He was faithful to the Lord and followed his instructions. And this is why the Lord's favor rested upon David. But I want you not only to focus on the commander of David, David the commander, David the king, David the, the general, but I want us to focus on some of the men in his army who were willing to do what it takes to defend him and his crown. Some of these men were elite fighting men, right? I believe that the Navy SEALs had nothing against these men, could do nothing against these men. These men were elite. In fact, it talks about the top three men, how powerful they are, how great they are. Because you see, they risked their lives for David's life. You'll find this in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Not yet, honey. We'll bring that up in a minute. 2 Samuel chapter 23. This is where we are introduced to some of these men. Now, let me just say this. I'm probably going to trash some of their names because I don't know what their mother was thinking. <laughs> I really don't. First man, he's the chief of the three. His name is Joseph Bashefa Bas. Heth Beth. <laughs> this man killed 800 men with a spear in one encounter. The next man is Eleazar. He stood with David and taunted the Philistines for battle. <laughs> Imagine this. Eleazar, one of the top three of men's, or David's men, here they are standing in the front line and they're taunting the Philistines. Let's fight. Let's go to war. Right? Talking to the Philistines. 
Here's the thing. At that moment, the men of Israel retreated. But Eleazar stood his ground and struck the Philistines until his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The next guy, his name is Samah. Put that, we'll put this up on this. I wanted to, to bring this out, bring it about. So after, after him, so it says after him, it's talking about Eleazar. So after Eleazar. So after him was uh, Shammah, son of Agi, the Herat. The Philistines had assembled in formation where there was a field full of lentils. The troops fled from the Philistines, but Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. I want you to picture this. He took his stand in the middle of the field, defended it, and struck down the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. One man. This guy, the next guy, is my favorite. Benaniah. I like this guy. Right? So I, we got it up on the screen. So Benaniah, son of Jehoiadai. <laughs> son of Jeh. <laughs> Was the son of a brave man from Kazil. A man of many exploits. Benaniah. Benaniah killed two sons of Ariel of Moab. He went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. Who goes down into a pit on a snowy day to kill a lion? Your footing's off. The lion's angry and mad at you. Without explanation, he jumps in the pit. That's why I like him. He also killed an Egyptian, an impressive man. Even though the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaniah went down to him with a club, snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and then killed him with his own spear. You are not old enough to count that spear. That's some bad dudes. That's some powerful men. If you agree, at least nod your head or something. These men did everything they could to fight for David and defend him. And even when the odds were against them, they didn't retreat. They didn't cower. They stood their ground. They defended him. And the Lord blessed them. You see, I see the church like this. I see the church lining up like David's men. <laughs> You see, we're not reacting to the movement of hell. We're, we're going the pace of heaven, right? I see the church is lining up like David, Eleazar. Hey, Hades, let's get ready to rumble! That's the church. Should be lining up like David's men. Not afraid, not scared, standing up in the full armor of God, standing there and saying, is that all you got? Amen. That's how the church should be. That's how we were designed to be. Advancing the kingdom of heaven, no matter what the cost. Romans 1, 16 through 17 says this, For I am not ashamed, say not ashamed. Not ashamed. Say not ashamed. Of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews and also to the Greek, for in its righteousness of God, or for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. faith. This is the church that Jesus built on that rock. It is advancing all the time. And the devil has no power over it. We at Living Water do not allow him to come in. You know that every Sunday I walk around this entire building and I seal it in Jesus' name. Get out what doesn't belong to you. Lord. you got to do it. you got to fight for it. I see living water as David's men standing the line, not holding the line, advancing the line. 
That's who we are. Advancing the line. Did you know in September, actually September 9th, we will be three years old. Three years old. We're going to party like it's 1999. <laughs> but we'll be three years old. And when it started, Satan tried to stop it. When we launched, he was not too happy. Because we were on the line saying, what you got? Oh, he came. He came. He's still coming. But we advance. We keep moving forward. <laughs> we actually got his favorite. How do you like that? Let me tell you about how Living Water advances. You've always heard me say that I believe that the church is to impact the community, not the community impacting the church. You've always heard me say it. If you've never heard me say it, you heard it today. Here's how we impact our community. For the last two or three weeks, we're not doing it anymore, but we collected school supplies. Not for the kids and not for all that stuff, but for teachers. Because teachers, uh, sometimes they, they run out of supplies in their classrooms, right? And so um, we, we, we donated our stuff uh, to, to uh, Coles Elementary and Boys and Girls Club. Just hand, handed it to them. We are actually in the process of, um, my friend Jeff and I, we are, we're actually handing out Bible tracts downtown. Our goal is to, to uh, get it all set up because we want to train you all to come out with us. In fact, a group will go with Jeff, a group will go with me, we'll teach you how to do it, then you become leaders and you take a group and we'll impact it. Sometimes people say, I don't want that Bible track. Sometimes people say, I don't know Jesus and they get Jesus right there. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple, right? Isn't that advancing? Isn't that moving forward? Isn't that taking territory away from the devil? It is. One of the things that we believe here at Living Water is that we believe that we should not reinvent the wheel. What's the point of that? Right? There are so many other uh, places here in town that are impacting our community the way that the church should be impacting the community. So why are we not partnering up with them and helping the force go for further? Here's what we partnered up with. Kamiya House is our homeless shelter. Needs, Safe House, Life Choice, USI, Habitat for Humanity, and soon, Volunteers of America, otherwise known as VOA. Somebody, they said, do you know what VOA is? And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> then when you say Volunteers of America, you're like, all right. right. If you say USI, you don't know what that means. It's Unattended Student Initiative. That's for our homeless teenagers here in town. We're very, we're, we're very involved in them. In fact, the new director of USI, his name is Austin, he, he contacted me a couple weeks ago. He says, hey, Jason, there's, there's this event that's going on that's going to be uh, raising uh, some funds, not only for us, but for four other uh, agencies. And, uh, well, um, you, you always told me that if I needed volunteers, I, I should call you. And I was like, okay. And so he says, so here's what's going on, here's what's happening. And we talked about it, and so, and he says, I said, well, how many volunteers do you need? He goes, I need about 16. And I was like, done. I can get you 16 volunteers. So the thing that is happening on September 11th is called, uh, um, it's called Cars, Cigars, and Guitars. Okay? Uh, and this event is going to be bringing awareness and, and funds to not only USI, but to these other uh, folks. Uh, Kamiya House, the family place where we're, com we're connected to. Uh, but Austin called me first, so we're, we're volunteering to help him out. Okay, and so um, he said, hey, can you give me some 16 volunteers? So right after church today, right out here, there's a table out here. There's a sign-up sheet, men, to sign up for God's Mighty Men. <laughs> then there's gonna be two um, we're going to have two laptops, or not laptops, um, iPads out there for you to go sign up on that day. Michelle and Austin, who is here with us today, he's going to stand behind there, and he's going to help you do it. So it's going to be a Friday, Saturday, Sunday thing. Um, I'm only pushing Saturday. I, I told him I'd only push Saturday. Because, see, if you volunteer on Saturday, it's free for you to get in. 
If you volunteer on su a Friday or, or Sunday, uh, first of all, you'll miss church, so you can't go on Sunday. <laughs> uh, but it, you, there's, a, there's a fee that you have to get in, right? I like free. Free sounds good to me. And so um, it's free. Here's the thing. Um, they, and it, and it, it's filling up pretty fast. But um, so they need some folks to stand at the gate. Now, you don't have to be there all day. It's like a two-hour increments or whatever. So you can just sign up and say, hey, I can do from two to four or whatever it is. Or I can do four to six or whatever. It's on, it's on the 11th uh, on Saturday. And so you just come up and you say, hey, I want to sign up. Uh, and you pick it. So you can stand at the gate and he's just making sure that authorized personnel are coming in. There's like two or three gates that you're going to do that. There's a uh, registration tent. Right, um, and so that one is filling up pretty quick because I'm assuming it's in the tent, so you're out of the heat. There's also another registration place at one of the gates. You can sign up for that as well. You can sign up at uh, at a food where you can serve food. You can be a part of that as well. You can sign up there, or you can uh, you can sign up and be one of the people uh, who collects the trash um, and, and takes it where it needs to be. Nobody has signed up for that yet. I mean, like, and these other five uh, agencies. They have to have volunteers as well, right? Let me just say that they asked the USI, hey, can you bring some volunteers to help? And, and Austin said yes, and so we're, we're gonna do that. And so um, if you're gonna do, if you wanna be part of the, uh, the trash folks, uh, you have to be 18 years of old, and, or 18 years of old. You have to be 18 years old, and you have to have a valid driver's license. That caught my attention. I was like, I wonder what kind of vehicles we get to drive. <laughs> I'm gonna sign up to be the trash guy. <laughs> I think that would be sweet. Hey, it's a dirty job, but I can do it, right? So um, partnering up with USI. Do you know what partnering up means? Partnering up means that we're investing, right? So here at Living Water, uh, we don't have a membership of Living Water. We don't. Hey, what church do you go to? I'm a member of Living Water. You're not a member of Living Water. We don't have membership here. If you want a membership, go to Sam's Club, okay? It gives you a card and access and all that stuff. What we do have here is partnership. I'm a partner of Living Water. You know what that means? Because partners invest in it. There's an investment in it. So many people hang their hat up what membership is. What about partnership? I want partnership, not membership. So, right afterwards, after church today, when we're done, as we are an offensive-minded church, as we are partnering up with USI, as we have done that um, uh, since this church has been in existence, um, we're going to step forward and take, uh, take back what the devil's trying to take from us. There is no reason why any teenager should not have a roof over their head. None. None. At all. And if we're going to impact our community, then let's get some teenagers off the street. And let's let them know that they're loved. Coming soon, Habitat for Humanity is doing a, a building project for a veteran. We're working on dates to get that so we can volunteer and help build up some of these homes. Amen? Listen, Jesus built the church to spread the message of Jesus. That's what we're doing here at Living Water. We're spreading the message of Jesus. We're making a difference in our community all in Jesus' name, amen? amen? Matthew 16, 18 says this, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build, say build, my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Amen. Jesus is building a kingdom-minded church, and he's doing it with living water. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. The name that is above every name. Father, we thank you that you are the designer and the creator of the church. We thank you, God, that the church was built to be engaging and advancing, moving at the pace of heaven, moving at the pace of your kingdom, moving at the pace of you. Father, I pray, God, that we would become even more powerful. Like you said, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Lord, let us live our lives like that. We want, when people see us, God, we don't want them to see us. We want them to see you. And be 
loved by you. Father, as I stand on the stage and I, I look out into the sea of people, Father, I see people primed and ready to advance, to be offensive-minded, to advance your kingdom. <laughs> Father, you just, <laughs> he just gave me this, this little vision. Like the church, his body is moving forward and on the side is all of uh, hell and his dominions and Satan and yelling at us, but we don't hear him. We're actually moving forward like a, like a, I don't know, like a flash flood kind of thing. And, and the devil and his minions are on the side and they see the power of this, this river, this water, this church advancing, and they're scared. But they're yelling at us. You're worthless. You're no good. But we can't hear them. <laughs> we can't hear them because the roar of the water is too loud. And conquering everything in our, in our path in Jesus' name. That's the power of the church. Oh, I want to be a part of a church like that. And Father, I thank you, God, that I am. I thank you, God, that we are. You are. You have set us up to understand how powerful we are. I thank you for the church. I thank you for its advancements. God, let us take back what was rightfully ours and know it. There's some of you sitting here today and, and Satan has taken too much of your life. Has taken too much of your ground, taken too much of your mind, taken too much of your heart, taken too much of your, your um, situation. Maybe too much of you. You know, the devil will only take what you give. But I'm wondering right now if there's any men or women or even children that are in here right now who are saying, Lord, I, can't, I don't want him to have any more territory in my life. I'm going to surrender it to you. I'm giving my life to you. Maybe you're saying that for the very first time. You never asked Jesus to come and be your Lord and Savior. You thought about it. You think it sounds like a good idea. Things are happening in your life. You're struggling with some things. Situation, maybe a health, uh, a health thing, a job thing, a, a, a house thing, a financial thing, or a mental thing. Something, something's happening in your life, and, and, and you know that there's, there's something different that you need to get. And I'm wondering if Jesus is speaking to you right now and saying, hey, I'm right here. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you've never asked him to be your personal Lord and Savior. And you're tired of what the devil's doing, taking your ground from you. And you're ready to give your life over to him. You see, the Bible says this in Romans. It says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Jesus also says in John uh, chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is it. He's the ticket. He's the only way. I guess my question is, is if you haven't asked him to be your Lord and Savior today, why not today? Why not surrender him today? And say, Lord, whatever the devil's taken, I'm, I need you to take it back. Conquer it back. If that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, and you want to make that happen today. I'm going to ask you to do a brave thing and just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, I want Jesus in my personal Lord and Savior. I surrender my life to you. Hallelujah, I see you. And some of you are sitting here today. Maybe you've gotten off track. Maybe you've allowed Satan to steer your life a little bit. 
and you've given your life to Christ, you're like, you know what, I just need to get back. I need to get back on track. I need to follow him. My life was better with him. <laughs> if you're just saying, I need to give my life, I need to rededicate my life, I need to come back to Jesus. Every head bowed, no one's looking around, no one's judging. Just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, will you pray for me? I need to come back to Jesus. I need to come back to Jesus. I'm going to give him my all. Yes. Maybe some of you are sitting here right now, and you're saying, Pastor, there's a situation in my life that I need prayer for, and he knows. You pray for me. If that's you, you need prayer. Just lift up your hand. Say, I need prayer. Yep, I see you. I see you. Yep, I see you. Heavenly Father, I come to you, Lord. And Father, I want to lift up your children to you. The ones that you know by name you know all of us. Father, many of us raised our hand and said, Lord, we have a situation. And I need you to take over. Father, I ask that you just take over. I ask God that you would, you would handle it needs to be handled. I pray, God, that you would step in and just have your way. Father, I pray that you would speak life into them. I pray, God, that you'd breathe your breath into them, Lord. I pray, God, that you would handle that situation, that they would lay it at your feet, that you would put your yoke upon them, and they would put their heavy burdens or their chains upon you and say, Lord, I can't do this anymore. Take over. Father, I pray that you just take over. Because you are good. And your love for us endures forever. I pray for freedom. Father, I pray, God, for those who just need to experience your freedom. I pray that they would receive it today. I pray, God, for forgiveness. That those who need forgiveness would receive that today. That they'd walk out free and forgiven. With a new identity transformed by you, Lord. I thank you, God. For this army of people, Father, who said, like Isaiah, here am I, send me. Without fear, without hesitation. We all can do something. We all can do something. Father, we have an opportunity to do something. Father, whether that is we, uh, we serve on September 11th when we're helping out USI or Habitat for Humanity at the end of September or whenever um, Volunteers of America says, hey, we're ready. Father, God, that we would just step out and do it and proclaim your name without fear, without hesitation. That we would move forward and, and advance the ball and, and gain the ground. Because you're the one who built the church. You're the one who has gave us the keys to heaven, Lord. So may we open the doors that those keys allow us to open. And may we walk through those doors, Lord. And may we recognize, Lord, that we are more powerful than we know, than we think, than we understand. That we would tap into that, Lord. And we would, we would walk hand in hand with you. And we would breathe you in and say, God, we want more of this. Father, we're praying, God, that many people would be coming to your altar and coming to your throne room and surrendering their lives to you, Lord. Surrendering their lives to you, God. Turning over addictions, Father. Turning over their marriages to you, Father. Turning over pain to you, Father. In Jesus' name, I'm praying, God, that you would just move, Holy Spirit, in this place so powerful and so thick that all we do is fall to our knees because we're in the presence of you. And all we do is move when you tell us to move. Oh God, I I wanna I wanna I wanna change this community with an army of people like David had. People who feel like they're they're not valuable, but they see that they are valuable because we tell them about the love of Jesus. Those who feel like they're not important, those who feel like they have no identity. Those who just need to hear Jesus loves you. I know it makes me happy when I hear you say I love you. (laughs) 
Paul, your word says that if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. Father, and I believe that inside this room right now, faith is bigger than a mustard seed. I believe we're going to move continents. Yes. I believe that. Thank you, Father, for using us. When we say use us. Woo. And we just pray this in Jesus' mighty and powerful holy name. Amen. 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 Listen. There's some folks that are standing right up here. If you just need some prayer, come to them afterwards. They, these are prayer warriors. We're going to pray with you, walk with you. If you're interested in, you say, hey, you know what? I can give up a couple hours on September 11th. Come to the table, sign up. Meet Austin. Meet Michelle. <laughs> I didn't mean to laugh. <laughs> but let's stand as we sing this last song. I always say this when we stand. Welcome to the throne room of Jesus. He's here. It's time to worship Him. It's time to be with Him. So sing out. So we will take